it will have a breakdown of the various fossil layers, fossil formations, and by the by the uh, collection, the suite of fossils, what different species you find in this particular layer, you can determine what fossil layer you're at just by the seashells, brachiopods, and the other life forms in the environment. You can kind of it's a little bit tricky to know that, but once you've been at it for a while and you read up in books, you can figure it out. In the future, I will have a uh, beginner's class on that on tape. Uh, it'll be converted to video, but it may not be for a few months. In the future, I'll have a how to identify fossil formations on video, but it won't be for a while. This is another favorite brachiopod. Make sure to see the uh, fossil field trip photos, I'm sorry, videos of uh, September and October 2007 to see uh, a lot of these being collected. Strophomena. Here's the outer shell. Here's the bottom of the inside of the shell. Another beautiful shell. One of my most favorite of all Cincinnati Brachiopods is Hebertella. This is the top, this is the bottom. This is the inside of the shell. Very distinctive shape. Okay, this display of my raffinus squinos, they show various things. This row in particular shows the enveloping of bryzoan. Just a little bit at the top to maybe 20% at the top, 100% at the bottom. And I want you to see just how much these shells. This is just a thin little layer, but you don't see the, hardly any bit of the shell sticking out at all. Just a little hint right there of the shell sticking out. The rest of it is indeed enveloped. Totally enveloped by Bryzoa. Same thing on the next one, but you can still make out the shell because it's a very thin envelope. Here it's about 80 percent on that one. And there's even a worm tube there. Okay. I want to show you just how bad it can be. Check this out. This is a bryozoan dome growing right on top of. Can you see the shape? Look at that. See, you can just barely see, even on the inside of the lip, it grew all around that too. Right there's some of the shell sticking out. So it's just amazing how much. Uh, this bryzone has taken over and grown upwards. Here's another one here, except it's been done on a clamshell. You'll have to check out my uh, bryzone videos in the future. Okay, There will be additional parts to brachiopods, additional videos added as time goes by. The more and more spectacular specimens that I discover as well as people bring into the dry dredgers. Um, they may be added every few months. It's hard to say, but just look up at the top of the video and however many parts it says. You know, every, every, time what, every time a new video segment is put on, I'll increase the numbers. It'll be indicated in the numbers. This rock may be about 18 inches across and it has well over a thousand Theridonta brachiopod seashells within it. I'll give you a close up here. Some of them are beaten and worn, beaten, broken bits and pieces, rough edges. Just amazing the sheer quantity and concentrations that some of these seashells obtain. And these rocks are just obviously one little fragment out of a jigsaw puzzle of the cemented seafloor. In museums they will actually 
pick up all the rocks around it, left, right, all around and create a tile mosaic fill out like maybe a 10 foot by 10 foot area and you can clearly see the uh, sea floor and the progression of uh, all the species laid out. It's just an amazing thing. As fossil hunters we're only seeing one rock here, one rock there. We do not have a mental picture of what it actually looked like. In other words we're only seeing one rock fragment and we sticking out of the cliff face but we really don't have a clear picture of what it looked like the way that the uh, Museums can put these back together um, to show an entire surface area of the seafloor and not just one little piece of the puzzle. Now, a little bit of an explanation of what you've seen. The seafloor communities, a lot of times what's responsible for causing these fossils to be found the way they are is that they, uh, they're, many of these are resting peacefully and along come some bad sea storms. Uh, hurricanes and they will drop and push a lot of silt burying whole communities alive in place in a very natural peaceful mode uh, that is they're laid out very very peacefully as you can see in this one and other instances they uh, they are all jumbled together in other words you can see the pushing of the sediments into a much more smaller compacted space. Here the raffid Esquina fossils are all laid out nice and peaceful. Here they've all been squished together by hurricane forces and the reason we know this is because it compares exactly to what they look like today when a hurricane goes by in modern day seas and does the exact same thing to seashells. Uh, that is they almost what was laying peacefully on the ground they've all been squished together and they have appearance you're seeing all these dozens and dozens of shells on their edges it almost has a furry fuzzy like fuzzy like texture but what that is it's that all the edges of these seashells compacted one on top of another almost like pringle uh, potato chips coming out of a can one fitting into the next one into the next one into the next one if you can see that that the these are all the edges of the raffin queen of seashell if I turn it over you can see one or two to get a get a feel of those shells being smacked and uh, shuffled and just compacted compressed one into another so that's from hurricane force storms those storms will come along and uh, tremendous current force to do that now a lot of times I'll have creationists write into me on these videos and jump up and down and get excited saying, oh see now that's proof of uh, that's proof of Noah's flood. You've got all these aquatic animals being fossilized where it's now land and you've got this uh, terrible storm type evidence so it must be Noah's flood. No, that's incorrect. The reason why and Leonardo da Vinci set forth this explanation the 15th century and it's still true to this day um, these are all they all these animals lived prior to any vertebrate animals alive on land uh, the ages don't match whatsoever you have a 60 million year span uh, of these sea creatures being fossilized and I know how extremely skeptical the young earth creationists are on the dating methods so for that I will fall back to a much easier method and that is go to the coral, go to the full coral fall. Okay. When you have layer upon layer of bryozoan reefs and coral reefs buried one on top another that there are literally more than a thousand layers of those in just the Ordovician alone and take into account that there's also the Cambrian below it, the Silurian, Devonian rock layers above it and various parts of the world you see different exposures of what's there but the point being is there's a huge, vast passage of time and one layer of seafloor community, one atop another. And that cannot be laid down in less than a year's time in Noah's Flood. When you see all these animals together, like this in a row, it's because they were living there. There's no way these species can all be put into this category, into this category, 
into this category, and to this category by Noah's flood. There is no organizing force of seawater that can somehow segregate these species. It did so because these animals were living and breeding together in various patches, just like you have wildflowers in the forest. Same idea, they lived and concentrated there. Um, the point being is that they cannot be swept by hurricane-like forces of, of the fictional Noah's Flood and somehow be arranged like this.